Welcome to the show. My name is James Nielsen Watt, and in this show, we interview interesting, inspiring, and successful people so you can learn the secrets to success and can play the game of life, business, health, and happiness better. And the philosophy we take here is if I'm leveling up my game, you get to level up yours as well. So get ready to listen to some inspiring people who have figured out how to have success in all areas of life, health, happiness, wealth, business. We're going to be interviewing them in this show so that you can learn the secrets to success that they share with practical advice that you can take and use today. So if you enjoy the show, please subscribe, please leave us a review, and please share it with your friends because if I can help you and you can help others, then we can help more people together and we can all level up our game together. My guest today is Vincenzo Guzzo, a successful entrepreneur, philanthropist, TV personality, and president and CEO of Cinema Guzzo, the largest independent chain of cinemas in Quebec, as well as the largest, third largest in Canada. As the only son of Italian immigrants, he always believed he could turn his dad's small theater business into the mega-scaled empire it is today, and he did. His chain has a total of 145 screens, 9 IMAX cinemas, and 10 locations, with more set to open over the next three years. Vincenzo became a national figure in 2018 after he joined the five-man investors panel of CBC business reality show Dragon's Den for its 13th season, and he has been on the show till date. Welcome to the show, Vincenzo. Super excited to have you on, my friend. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I'd love it if you could give our audience some background context on on who you are and and where you've come from and, and what you're doing these days. So I'm a, um, you know, I guess a Canadian Montreal born uh, businessman, entrepreneur. Uh, I'm on reality TV on CBC's Dragons Den. Um, for, for anybody in the US, it's basically uh, before you had Shark Tank, well, there was Dragons Den and then in the US it became called Shark Tank. Um, I'm, I'm really known for my involvement in the movie industry. Uh, I own movie theaters and uh, I'm the guy who, um, has a hard time keeping his mouth shut when it comes to uh, political uh, uh, screw ups from my politicians, either provincial or federal, right? So I, I let everybody have it. And, uh, you know, my nickname is Mr. Sunshine and uh, it's because like the sun, everybody needs some sun, but every once in a while you get overexposed to the sun and you get a sunburn and you regret having uh, crossed the sun, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, things are, interesting things are going on in Canada at the moment, aren't they? Well, interesting, if not the strangest of things. I mean, for one of the countries that uh, was always at the forefront of, uh, of I guess, democracy and, 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 you know, what democracy stood for, we're actually in a, at a crossroads, which is very particular. I mean, uh, yeah. I actually use, uh, I, I use a comment uh, often nowadays when people use a word uh, without necessarily, you know, I mean, there's some buzzwords, right? So I'm on a board of a school and, the buzzword these days is we want more discipline, right? And, and so I always say, okay, guys, it's a great word, discipline. You know, it reminds me of Justin Trudeau using the word democracy. Doesn't mean very much. Can you just explain to me what the hell you mean by discipline, right? And it's the same thing here. So, I mean, you know, Canada's democracy these days is very particular. Uh, I, I would tell you, uh, you know, I, I think there's um, a lot of shaming going on. And, and I think that that stops what is the core spirit of democracy, which is debate, discussion. Uh, and that's what should help people that, that, you know, come to compromises, I guess. But hey, yeah. it is what it is. Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm, I'm in New Zealand uh, and, and there's a bit of that uh, going around, to, to, to say the least. Uh, but um, uh, how, did you, how did you sort of get to where you are now being on Dragon's Den and, and et cetera, et cetera? And, and tell us a bit about your journey because you grew was it your your father's theater is that right yeah so my father was a machinist uh, who immigrated in canada in 1967 during expo um and basically i don't know how he thought about it but i mean he wanted to go into the cafeteria business but found it cheaper to go into the movie business so we ended up in the movie business and uh, so somewhere in the early 90s i had graduated from um economics at Western and then went to law school. And then I was headed to New York City to become a litigator. And that was my, my passion in life. I was uh, an only child. So, you know, I could really 
you know, sort of expand and do whatever I wanted to do. So as I like to say, I wanted to be the Harvey Specter uh, before Harvey Specter even existed, right? With the commitment issues and so forth and so forth. Uh, but my dad asked me to stay behind a year uh, right after law school and say, look, why don't you try and give a shot at this family business that I started? Maybe, maybe you'll like it. So as I like to say, I was never, it was never in my plans to be an entrepreneur. And I ended up being an entrepreneur because of my litigation talents uh, in the movie industry. And so one thing led to another, and then I became uh, uh, a full-fledged uh, uh, member of the team and, and never went to uh, New York to be a Harvey Specter um, and so forth. And, and you know, then one thing led to another, I guess. Once you get the, the entrepreneurial bug, you know, it's a sort of a, there's an, ele a, an element of adrenaline that drives you, right? So a lot of people, a lot of people don't like the comparison, but I, I, I do compare being an entrepreneur to being a gambler with the only difference is that an entrepreneur has uh, sort of his destiny in his hands. A gambler is sort of playing the odds, right? Uh, uh, and, and the odds aren't in your favor when you're playing at a casino. So long-term you're gonna get burned. Um, and so I guess that adrenaline part, which was what I was looking for as a litigator, was also present in the entrepreneurial spirit. And then one thing led to another. And like I said, we went from owning movie theaters to expanding in the movie theater business to you know, uh, opening up a construction division. From the construction division, we opened up a real estate division. From that, we went to restaurants. And then one thing led to another. And, and always having been a, an outspoken individual, uh, I like to say, because I had no brothers and sisters to argue with, I always had the floor. I always won the arguments. I argued with myself. Uh, and so uh, uh, that sort of, I guess I, I was raised in a way that I always just spoke my mind, right? Because there was nobody to offend or nobody to be worried about what they thought. Uh, and then in the real world, well, then I realized that, oh, well, that's really controversial only because I said the truth. Uh, and so... Over the years, I've, I've, I've justified my behavior by saying um, I, I have too many things to remember. The last thing I want to remember is lies that I've had to say to be politically correct. So I might as well just say the truth and bother everybody along the way. But at least I have nothing to remember It's because it's just the truth. And that's easy to remember. right? So, in fact, still today, you know, once in a while, somebody says to me, you said that once. And I said, impossible. And he says, what do you mean? Because I wouldn't say that. It's just not the kind of stuff I would say. I know exactly what I would say. And what I would have said is this, for example. And people say, oh, my God, that's so rude. How would you have said that? Oh, no, because that's the way I would have said it. And, and, and that I couldn't remember. What you're saying is way too nice. That's not the way I would have said it uh, type of thing. So, you know, I, I guess that's what attracted uh, uh, me or, or attracted the producers of Dragons then. They were looking for a... Uh, I guess, a, a, a new version, uh, 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 Mr. Wonderful, and they got Mr. Sunshine in, in the process. I was, I was going to, I was going to say, how, how did you kind of, uh, how did you even end up in doing that uh, and doing a show? Like what drew, what drew you to, to do that instead of many other things that you could have done? What was the, what was the intrigue for you? So, so I had been approached by Sony so I'm in the movie business, right? Being in the movie business and the theater business, uh, you know, 1998 was a big year for us where we opened up in markets that were considered closed zones to our largest competitors. And so we literally, you know, had antitrust suits going on and so forth and so forth. And so I got to deal firsthand with people in LA, not necessarily through their Montreal office that then reported to Toronto and then reported to LA, right? The minute you go to court against somebody, you're dealing with the head guy in LA. And so I guess over time, people would say as a joke all the time, you know, you should have your own talk show. You know what I mean? You're like, you're a funny guy, you know, like you're, you're sort of, but you got to remember, I, 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 I moved up in the ranks in the movie industry at the same time as Howard Stern was creating his, you know, his, his no BS kind of radio show. So everybody assumed that, hey, you know, you, you could actually be good at a, at a, at a talk show. Uh, so the people at Sony had started approaching me, asking me uh, a number of times what I would or wouldn't do. And if I, you know, so they were looking probably for 
keeping up with the Kardashians, but, you know, keeping up with the Gutsos. And, and that didn't fly very well with my wife or some of my kids. So I said, that's not going to happen. And then the next, you know, the next the best alternative to that was, you know, a show where you were, it was all about you and not necessarily about your surroundings or the people around you. Uh, and ultimately what happened is that we, um, we, I was approached by the people at Dragon's Den and they said, hey, because of your business success and because of your frank way of, of saying things, maybe, you know, you know, we'll have to, we'll have to doze you a bit because it is CBC and, you know, it's a government owned, uh, uh, you know, TV broadcasting station. So, we, you know, we're going to have to avoid some of the F words here and there. We're going to beep you a few times, but, but I think we can get you going, you know. Um, what's, what's been the most enjoyable part for you to come? Sorry. Sorry. What um, I was saying, what, what was the most uh, enjoyable part for you to kind of continue that going forward? Like, has it just been a, a challenge? Is it the people that you're a part of? Is it the, the business opportunity? Like what keeps you going with it? So when I did it at first, when I began doing it, what was interesting was, Hey, you know what? It's an experience. It's, you know, let's just try it. You never know what, what will come from it. Very quickly, what I realized is, hey, wait up a minute. This is a great opportunity into the, into the space of other people and into possibly investing in other, in other spaces uh, uh, where I'm not known in or where I wouldn't necessarily be approached, right? So I've been approached for real estate deals, movie theater deals, entertainment deals. When it came to food deals, when it came to stuff like that, Nobody thought of me. I wasn't the natural uh, uh, at that level. So this opened up the door for that. Um, I want to go back to something you said before about entrepreneurship and gambling um, and that, right. that rush. I, I, I agree. I don't gamble. It doesn't make any sense right. to me. I don't know why anybody would. I've been with friends, you know, we'll go to the casino or whatever. And I immediately, if for, it was to entertain the idea of doing it, although I never have, would be to play the game that I have control over to more of an extent. But even then I don't like it because the house wins statistically more and et cetera, et cetera. And some of these games and there's sharks there that is going to eat me up. So you know, I'm not going to play in the leagues of people that I can't, you know, I can't play with, but I've got friends that will just go there and just stick dollars into, you know, pokey, we call them in New Zealand pokey machines, right? Just pull in the thing, spin in the wheel. And I'm looking, I'm like, how can you do that? Because you have no control over the outcome. What I enjoy with entrepreneurship and this, what you said kind of makes so much sense is like, there is this sense of risk. And I suppose that there could arguably be risk, but it never feels like that because it feels like I have control over it. So if something doesn't go my way, there is always a solution in my head. There's always a way. I've just got to figure out who or what to solve it. And so you get this rush of the, the, the risk, but it's not really risk because I have control. Um, so I've noticed with people that, are, that I've interviewed and with myself as I've progressed as an entrepreneur, that your ability to understand risk mitigate risk and so i suppose you could say your risk tolerance but I, I don't like to say that because i don't look at what i'm doing as being risky others might but i don't right because i've got a strategy how would you help somebody to uh recognize their ability to to deal with risk better or perceive risk better uh so to speak lift their risk tolerance to help them as an entrepreneur because i think it's such an important skill you know, I, I think at the end of the day, there's no real way, you know, look, I, I have this debate every time I get called into a university class that, it, you know, is titled, uh, uh, you know, entrepreneurship or learning entrepreneurship or whatever. And I said, then I said, uh, can you really teach somebody how to be risk adverse or, you know, more tolerant to risk? I, you know, what I think some of those classes should be called are the elements you should possess if you want to be an entrepreneur, right? So are legal skills a plus? Yes. Or accounting skills a plus? Yes. Or negotiation skills a plus? Yes. But only because I have all of those skills, it doesn't mean I'll be a great entrepreneur. Because at the end of the day, being an entrepreneur means having resilience. It means at certain levels, enjoying the pain of, you know, it, it's like, a, it's like exercise. Um, if you run a marathon, 
there's pain along the way. I mean, you know, you get a cramp, you, you, you know, the, the, the muscles start warming up and, and you're sort of like, but, but you still do it, right? And, 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 and the fact that you've been able to tolerate that pain and then accomplish by passing that finish line is the, is the, the goal, is the victory, is the satisfying part. When it comes to being an entrepreneur, as much as some entrepreneurs are seen as reckless, we're not. I mean, I mean, I'll give you a good example. There are entrepreneurs who are actually very calculated and, and they've minimized the risk factor in their decisions. The problem is that as they win all the time, you know, it reminds me of the student. Well, actually, you know what? I'm going to backtrack and I'm going to give you this example. So one day, you know, I, I had to write an exam. I was very young and, and I... And I you know, bumped into my priest the day after the exam. And I said, you know, Father, I prayed for 10 hours, studied for one, and I failed that exam miserably. He says, well, maybe you should have tried praying for one and studying for 10. Says, okay. So I did that for the next exam, and it went re really well. And that exam looked so easy. But somehow I forgot that I had spent 10 hours studying for it. So then the next exam, I only spent nine hours. And then the exam after that, I only spent eight hours, right? And so what happens is eventually you start taking things for granted and then, and then making a mistake is what brings you back to the basis of being an entrepreneur, which is the sacrifices associated to the entrepreneurial journey. Many entrepreneurs start off their journey not being risk tolerant and become risk tolerant because they become more cocky. They become more comfortable with risk. And some of them then take business risk and transform it into a lifetime risk. For example, my wife has gone parachuting a few times and she tells me, would you come the next time? And I said, no. And she says, what do you mean? No. And she goes, but why no? Because no, it just, it's, there's a no, there's no arguing here. And she says, but I don't understand. I says, well, let me put it to you this way. I'm an only child. I got five kids and a wife to take care of. I'm not jumping off a parachute. I mean, there's no thrill for me. She says, but you know, the, the fact that you're, you know, in, in, in free falling and that, you know, you're free of everything. Right. And what if the parachute doesn't open? Yeah, I know, but the chances, okay, whatever the chances are, there's a chance, right? I'm not interested, right? So as much as I'm willing to risk on somebody, on a partnership, on a, on a deal, I mean, you know, a lot of people don't realize even getting married nowadays is a risk, right? You get married, it's for life. Yeah, sure. Tell that to somebody else with the amount of divorces we have, right? So there's always a risk. The problem is you've said it right. In an entrepreneurial journey, a successful one, what you're doing is you're learning to see the pitfalls before they occur. You're learning to evaluate the risk and you're learning to mitigate those risks. And you know that you have a control over that. When you see these multi-millionaires, billionaires end up in a casino and just throw hundreds of thousands of dollars at one throw of the dice, right? You know, that's more fuck you money. You know, that's like sort of like, I don't care. Like, I just want to prove I can do whatever I want. But it's also their way of saying, hey, how lucky can I be? How much of it is luck? How much of it is talent, right? And you have to remember that there's no better way to be a lucky person than to actually work at luck. The more effort, you know, so for every, for every course that I loved, I got great marks in. For every course I detested, I got horrible mark. You couldn't get me to study for procedural law, but you can get me to study for fiscal law because that was interesting to me. That was, you know, that was something that I knew, you know, could bring me something. As for, you know, procedural or constitutional law, I, you know, and I mean, I really don't care. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm not going to go argue, you know, a big constitutional fight with, with any government. So, at the end of the day, what I think is very important is to realize that an entrepreneur is a risk taker who wants a certain amount of control. He may not have the control when he's, when he's doing what he's doing, but he wants it. He needs it. And part of the ability 
uh, of an entrepreneur or part of the, 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 the talent he has to develop is that as he grows, he's got to learn to lose some control because he'll never be able to expand his business as much as he wishes to, right? I mean, we can micromanage when we have one location, two locations. The minute you're at, you know, like a gym tree living with 400 locations, you're not micromanaging. You've got to start trusting people. Now, that's where now your ability to control things becomes a talent where you put in the right amount, you know, the right people at the right places so that accountability is there and you can still manage your business, right? But you are right. I mean, I used to gamble because it was trying to understand the tolerance level that I had to risk, right? So when I would go to Vegas, you know, for movie conventions and so forth, we'd usually sit at the blackjack table, even though the best odds were at the craps table. But I would say, but, but how lucky, you know what I mean? Best odds, in what sense? I mean, I'm, some guy's throwing dice. And they fall the right way, I win. If they fall the wrong way, I lose. Like, why would I want to give destiny that kind of power over me, right? When it came to blackjack, your odds were still only 48%. And, and the house was gaining 52 So now the talent was a bit like in the stock market. You've got to know when to buy, when to sell, when to stop being greedy, when to walk away, right? The, the, the best talent at a blackjack table is knowing when to get up, whether that means I'm down 20,000 bucks, I'm going to get up and cut the losses or I'm up 20,000. I'm going to take my winnings and walk away. Now, somebody says, yeah, but who knows you wouldn't have won another four hands. Yeah, I know. But that's the problem is I don't read the future. And because the odds are always long-term in the favor of a casino, you take your money and run, right? So it's like when I invest in the stock market, I'm a big believer in oil. And people say, I know, but oil's not, it's ups and downs. Yeah, I know, but oil always goes up. We know that it always going to go up. Why? Because oil isn't going anywhere. As much as people believe that electric cars are going to make oil disappear, they're not. I mean, foam is made out of oil. Most of, the, most of the plastic PVC stuff that we have is made out of oil. So even the even part of the what, what we call today vegan leather, is actually made out of petroleum products, right? So as vegan as you want to call it, it's actually petroleum. So petroleum isn't going anywhere. Now, did I know we were going to go, you know, that COVID was going to help oil the way it did for the last two years? Did I know that, you know, Russia and Ukraine were going to go at it? And no, but I bought stock at $3. It's now at $65. Now, do I sell? Do I keep? What, what do we do, right? I mean, that's the gamble really that we're doing. So in many senses, people who gamble, on the stock market are doing nothing else but being entrepreneurial, but they're also being gamblers at the same way they would in a casino. Uh, it's just a question of timing and the timing sometimes is a gut feeling, et cetera, et cetera. So, but you do have to have a tolerance to risk. I mean, you know, I lost $14 million in 12 months, the first 12 months of COVID. I mean, I, I, do I really still want to be in the movie business after that? Right. I mean, a lot of people have sold out of the business. I mean, I had more calls, after those 12 months of people selling theaters, then I did people wanting to buy theaters, right? Because some people just said, I've had enough. And, and so that's where the tolerance, you know, gets, and I guess you develop it as you go. Um, you, were, you were talking about uh, what, I, what I took as con consistency to the method of getting the outcome. If you are, you know, you studied for 10 hours and then you passed your exam and now you get cocky and you study nine. I see this a lot with, uh, with champions versus the greats or the hall of famers in, in a particular, for example, fighting sports, right? right? The ones who come up and they win and then they change what they're doing and then they, they lose uh, whether it's his management, whether it's mindset or, 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 or them like Mike Tyson, for example, um, with better management, I'm not a massive sports expert here, but better management and better headspace and better, you know, et cetera, could have been champion for a long time, but it was right. this rise and fall. And, and my naivety would attribute that to, to lack of consistency on the things that actually get you to win. And I think that's so important. We, we get to a place and we forget what we did that got us there. And then we don't, we're not consistent with it. But what you also said was that you have to to get to the next level, you have to give up some sense of control of what you had that got you to here. Because something that I live by is what got me here is not going to get me there. It'll keep me yeah. here. And so as much as it is an advantage to begin with, it got me to a place. 
it's the, then a disadvantage. And so I'm constantly going through this, this uh, continued evolution of learning new things and letting go of control and, and relearning, et cetera. Um, and I think that that's the, the gamble, if you will, but well, it's you're the using gamble, you're... but it's also, it's also the evolution of things. The truth of the matter is even the great athletes will continue the mindset, but will evolve in the mindset, right? So if, if you became a champion by putting in, call it 10 hours of exercise a day, you may still want to put 10 hours a day, but you're going to change the routine. You're going to realize that what worked with one adversary will not work with another. So now you're going to learn a different form of boxing or a different form of martial arts. You know, I mean, if we, if we do a comparison with the UFC, right? So not everything works all the time. But what we do know is that once you've been, once you've been hit, and once you no longer have that luster of invincibility, you know, it is harder to win, right? So Mike Tyson's example is a good one. Until he had not been beaten, he was unbeatable. The minute he got beaten once, he couldn't win anymore because now nobody feared him anymore to the point that it blocked them, right? And that's where the problem is with many entrepreneurs when it gets them to start is the fear blocks them from starting, right? So they use this, this quest for perfection. The plan isn't perfect enough. So I'll start when it's perfect. Truth of the matter is, the number one talent of an entrepreneur is adapting. You do it, you have an idea, you have a plan that's 75% perfect and you just do it. And then you adapt, why? Because the truth of the matter is there's no such thing as a predetermined outcome if you do something. Because the adversary, whether it's a, an individual like in a boxing match or in a UFC match or life itself or a competitor in the real world, you never know what the reaction is going to be, right? So you need to always be on the tip. You, you know, I think the one of the most important things that was ta taught to me when I was uh, playing soccer was never be flat-footed. Always, you know, be on the tip of your toes. And I could never understand, but why? Well, because it makes you more agile. It makes you more quickly adaptable to the play that's going on. Hey, but... I said, yeah, I know, but it hurts my calves, you know, like being like that for such a long time. Well, you know, so I worked at it and then eventually I didn't have a problem being on the tip of my toes, right? And it's the same thing. You know, entrepreneurs need to learn to, to weather crises, right? So one of the interesting thing about movie theaters is when everybody calls, you know, is predicting a recession, I sort of go, yeah, so... And it was, what do you mean? It's a recession. Yeah, I know, but movie theaters are anti-recession. I mean, everybody goes to the movies when it's a recession. It's the cheapest form of entertainment, right? And when a war usually goes, starts, people say, oh my God, the war, uh, unless it's on my territory, it's going to take 10 days for people to get over having to watch it on TV and then they'll go back to normality and go back to the movies and go out to restaurants. And right? unfortunately, humanity has a way of just moving on, right? And, and so... We've got to be able as entrepreneurs to lick our wounds and move on from, you know, the, the losses or from the, the lessons that we've been given during our entrepreneurial journey. I think the biggest mistake people make when it comes to being entrepreneurs is they, they think there's a, you know, they think it's like graduating from university. You study for three years and then you get a diploma. And now that means everything. Fact of the matter, it means absolutely nothing. In fact, some of my biggest disappointments was when I got my diplomas, and I said, "That's it, like, like nothing else here, like no, no other brouhaha, no big party, nothing, nothing. Like it's over, right? It's like no, you know, at least a marriage. I like to say you get, you know, a week or two of honeymoon, you know, to sort of continue the party going on. But you come back home, and it's like, okay, so now we're back to normality, right? So it's the same thing." So ultimately, an entrepreneur shouldn't be looking at the final outcome of a project. They should be looking at the journey. They should remember 
the lessons they've learned along the way, right? So it's, it's like, you know, it's not the singular success, right? I was giving a, a, a discussion to a few university students a while back, and one of them said to me, when did you know that you had succeeded? When you told me, this, what do you mean? I, I still don't understand. I mean, I'll accept the compliment that you all think I'm successful, thank you, but I, between the day that you said to me, successful businessman and the day before, I, I don't see the difference in that 24 hour span, right? And what is success? Is it a hundred, a hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars, a hundred million dollars? Is it enough money to do what you want? I don't know, right? It's it's just about. I I would tell you that success is defined very differently by a lot of people, and and I'll give you an example of how awkward success can be interpreted. I had a a journalist once, a French Canadian journalist. Who was a very good journalist. I mean, you know, I mean, I didn't agree with her opinion pieces, but in all intents and purposes, there was nothing wrong with her. We couldn't say she was an incompetent journalist or whatever. But clearly, she had some bias against Italian immigrants or whatever. And she said to me, you know, given your success, you know, is, is it due to some friendship with some under, you know, uh, organized crime, you know, individuals? And I said, seriously, thank you for the compliment. You know, and she said, oh my God, are you like, taking as a compliment that I, that I think you're maybe a member of organized crime. And I said, well, I mean, what you are telling me by asking me such a dumb question is you're really asked, telling me that what my dad, my mom, and I did as a trio is such an amazing feat that you think it would require the help of an organization who's got tentacles around the world, who's gone to the point of maybe assassinating a president. Wow, that's pretty impressive. I didn't really think I did anything that extraordinary. I just thought I opened up a few theaters and made, you know, was successful at doing my job. By that, that's the, that's the, the, the awkwardness of when people say, what's the secret to success? I don't know. I, you know, sometimes I, I'm not in the mood and, and I turn around and I say, I don't know. When I get there, I'll let you know what it is, okay? Because I haven't gotten there yet. And it's just basically my way of saying, I don't know if, if I've achieved success. You know, I may have achieved success in what 16 year old me thought success was gonna be. Maybe I've achieved success based on what 25 year old me thought, but I don't know if at 52 years old, I can consider myself, hey, I've achieved the success that I want to achieve, right? So it's a continuous journey. Do I remember the good things in the journey? Sure. But I'll tell you what I remember more than the good things. I remember the really bad things. I remember the failures more than I do the successes. And that's what an entrepreneur needs to do because successes is what have, have brought the positive to you, but it's the failures that have brought you the lessons, the ones that will change your way of thinking, the ones that will make you realize what you need to do for step number two or step number 20 on your journey towards success, right? And, you know, 24 months of COVID, I, I mean, nobody can tell me that they've gone through it unscathed. Everybody has in some form or another been traumatized, been impacted by it, and has changed something in their lives. If anything but that it made us closer to our family on an everyday basis. Well, it took a traumatic experience of 24 months to make us realize that, hey, you know what? We should hang around with our kids a little more. We should hang around with our spouse a little more. We should go on vacation a little more. I mean, ever since travel restrictions have been somewhat lifted, I think I've been on like eight trips in the last six months. I've never traveled so much in my life. Uh, and it's because... I've said to myself, you know what, I got to, you know, I, I read something and, and I think I'm, I, I inadvertently use it now as a motto in my own way of thinking. A lot of people like to say that, you know, governments have managed to save billions of lives in the last two years. 
I instead think that most governments have wasted two years of billions of people's lives. And I'd like my two years back. And if that means I got to live more fully the next 10 years to get those two years back, you know, in small increments, I will. Because I, I think it was incredible. I mean, I tried to be very, you know, I tried to have a lot of solidarity with, with people. And I didn't do much traveling. I, you know, I did go to Toronto to film Dragons Den and so forth, but I did not travel as often as I did for business or for pleasure because I wanted to be able to be in my hometown, criticize my government and say, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong. And look, I'm triple vaxxed. I did what you guys told me to do. And I still think you're a bunch of amateurs, right? That's the job of an entrepreneur. You know, and, and many times... I hear people complain about entrepreneurs and say, well, you know, entrepreneurs are selfish and they, and they only think about their businesses. Maybe, but you do realize that every business isn't a singular person, every business. So in my case, you know, somebody once said, well, I don't care. Guzzo's got money. You know, the government can shut down theaters as long as it wants. It really doesn't bother me. Guzzo can pay. He's got all the money in the world. He's, he can afford it. And I sat there and I said, yeah, I know, but is anybody thinking about those 600 employees who don't have a job now? And, and is anybody thinking of the stress that creates on 600 families? And is anybody, you know, it's, and, and so it's a spinoff, right? All over the place. And so ultimately, you know, I mean, one of the things I think as an entrepreneur that I would suggest is that, you know, if I could, if I could say a word about politics, I'd say no politician is allowed to be a career politician. I don't think anybody should be allowed to leave university and become a politician. I think everybody should suffer in the real world, in the business world, somehow, somewhere. They'll make their bones and then they can go into politics and then they can be more, um, have more ability to skate. You know, I, I like to say politics is like figure skating. You've got to be able to woo the crowds while, you know, still getting the job done, right? Uh, and, and I think that, People today need to, need to, because of the communication skills that exist and because of the means to information that we have, I think people should be more outgoing and more uh, question stuff, right? I mean, you know, the, the latest thing that's occurring in our world right now is a conflict between Russia and, and Ukraine. But is it really a conflict between Russia and the Ukraine? Or is it not really a conflict between Russia and the U.S.? And the U.S. unfortunately has abandoned the Ukraine, even though the U.S. was trying to convince the you know the Ukraine to be part of NATO. And now because it's they're not part of NATO, we really can't. Guys, you got the Ukraine in trouble. You, you tried to convince them to be part of our team versus the Russian team, instead or instead of being neutral, and now you're letting them be, and, and, and it's wrong. And and I think people need to understand. People don't. That, People don't. Yeah, understand. people are dying. People are like, you know, and, and this is this is horrible. It's horrible to see how politicians don't take their responsibilities. Entrepreneurs have no choice but to take their responsibilities because it's their own pockets on the line. It's their own time wasted on the line on every project, right? That's what the difference is between business people and politicians is that at the end of the day, you know, we pay for our mistakes. Politicians don't, other people do. You know, I always, I always look and say, every time there was a president that had military experience in the, in the White House, the likelihood of going to war was a lot less than when it was a non-military experienced president. Why? Because the one who had done the war knew exactly the casualties and he avoided it at all costs. The guy who's never been to war, he says, who cares? It's war. It costs, you know, I mean, I always like when I hear politics, it's the cost of doing business. What business are you talking about? There's people's lives dying. I never have that in the balance in my decisions, right? Because the minute I, I, I would have that, those decisions would change dramatically. Uh, it's a business conflict. It's a business war, but it's nowhere near like the conflicts we have today. So being an entrepreneur is, it's a journey. It's not a, it's not a, 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 in French, they say, it's not a final, right? You're not, it's not one finish line. That finish line will change uh, along the way. A uh, hundred, you know, hundred million dollars is enough. 
until you get there. And then you say, well, you know, maybe 500 million would be better. And then you get there and say, well, you know what? Maybe a few billion dollars in the world. And then we're done. Then I promise we're done. And it's probably, you know, your time on earth will expire be before you give up on what the ultimate line is, right? Well, people, people that, that's the get that wrong. They, they get that yeah. wrong. They think that entrepreneurship is the way to get to the outcome. Like I'm going to get in a car and I'm going to drive there. So I'm going to get in the entrepreneurship vehicle and I'm going to get where I want to be. The irony is that from what I've seen and, and experienced myself and people I interviewed and things and, and watched, like that's not how you become a successful entrepreneur is not by using it as a vehicle. You become a successful entrepreneur because it's not a thing that looks cool on social media that you're going to do. You, you are it and you enjoy the process. People say things like, Elon Musk or whatever, he's got so much money, like blah, blah, blah. He's not doing it for money. He's enjoying the process and creating things. And, and the most successful entrepreneurs are those. Because I hear it where people say, why would you keep working if you've got this? That mentality is going to set you up for failure as an entrepreneur because you don't do it to get to the outcome. And if you are doing it for the outcome, you won't get there because you won't adapt you won't grow, you won't go past it, right? Like there's, there's well, layers to it, but um, it's, yeah. You know, one of the things, so a lot of people don't know this, but I'm dyslexic and I have one of my kids who's dyslexic um, out of the five kids that I have. So if, if you associate, and, 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 and if you look at the way most successful entrepreneurs think from a very young age, you realize they don't think like other people, like the average person. Many entrepre successful entrepreneurs or what we deem to be successful entrepreneurs are dyslexic. And, 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 there's, and, there's, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a question to be asked. Does being successful mean you gotta be a troublemaker? Means you gotta think outside the box. Means rules, what are rules? I mean, I used to always say to people, rules, what rules? What, what do you mean these are the rules? I mean, aren't rules only there to sort of put barriers to entry? So for me, it was like, wait up a minute. Who made up this rule? Who says I've got to do this to be a successful rugby player, for example, right? So when I played rugby, I would always tell my coach, guys, put me as fullback because all of those rules in the front on the scrum and this, they're too complicated for me, those rules. I'm a fullback. There is no rules. Okay, I grab the ball, kick the ball, run after the ball, grab the ball, push, but I do whatever I want. That's what I want to do. That's what my job is. And that's what I think. And so you ask yourself, guys like Elon Musk, guys like, you know, Bill Gates, who did not end up going to university because he goes like, because that's, that's the regular way of doing it, right? You go to, so Elon Musk went all the way, got all of the degrees, got all of the PhDs, got whatever he got. And now he's the bad boy of the, of the billionaires, let's call it, right? So, you know, Bill Gates can't really be seen as a bad boy, but Christ, he didn't go to university. You, can you imagine how his parents must have felt when they said, oh my God, well, what a wasted childhood here. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. How come he's not going to university, right? Because we have this thing of saying, if you follow the regular path, you'll get to the, 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 you know, the, the cherished, cherished fruit or whatever you want to get to. But the truth of the matter is, there's got to be other ways to get there. And it's the ones who push and say, no, why do I want to do it that way? I want to do it another way, right? And everybody who invents something, everybody who pushes who says, you know, we have this expression on dragons and the pictures do all the time. They say, there's got to be a better way. Yeah, there's got to be a better way. Find the better way, right? Or find a way that is less restricted. That's what being an entrepreneur is. It's, it's you know, Americans like to use the word maverick, you know, uh, you know, go west. You know, I mean, remember the old, the, the old legendary go west boy, you know, that's where the wealth is, right? Well, that's where the danger is too, but that's where... The unknown promised land is. That's where you're going to. And so somewhere along the way, successful people are people who want to do things differently. People who just say, why? Why? What, what do you mean I can't do this? Why not? Right? I, I mean, I, I went to school. I went to a private school, which was very Anglo-Saxon and very traditional in its ways. And, it, and I'll never forget when the headmaster one day said to me, 
we don't do that this way, you know, at school. We know, you know, you're at this school. We do things this way. Oh, guess those things are going to have to change because I don't like that way. And in fact, they've changed over the years, right? Why? Because there comes a point where you can't stop evolution in the name of tradition. Even traditions need to evolve, right? I mean, for example, I have Sunday lunch with my parents all the time. I have Sunday lunch with my you know, kids all the time when my parents are not in town. And every once in a while, I say, no, tonight's dinner instead of lunch. And everybody says, yeah, but, but normally we do lunch. Yeah, but we're going to do dinner tonight because I'm busy at lunch doing something else. This is, yeah, I know, but because I had planned something. Well, that's your fault. Unplan whatever you had planned because Sundays is a holy day. And your father decides the day, right? And so traditions need to change. And if Monday's a holiday, well, maybe we'll move the Sunday religious lunch or dinner to Monday because I'm in the mood to move it to Monday and I want to go play golf on Sunday. That's what it is. Leave me alone. And, and so dare to say why, dare to contest. That is what an entrepreneur's job is. And ultimately, every time an entrepreneur succeeds, whether we like it or not, society succeeds, right? And just look at it this way. Every time Elon Musk comes up with another crazy idea, it actually becomes a pretty good idea after a few years. You say, wait a minute, this is not that crazy. An electric car, that's not, well, does it work? Why? But electric cars are no good. Look, they, they got no speed factor. And all of a sudden, one of the fastest cars on the road is an electric car, right? Even I, who's not necessarily a big fan of Tesla, have put in an order for the truck. I think that truck's cool, right? So why? Because I now I think he's proven, yeah. right? He's proven the certain... And, and you've got to give Elon his... His do. He's brash. He's annoying. He sometimes, you know, he, sometimes he says the wrong things. But as I like to say, I rarely say the wrong thing. It's just you misunderstood what I was really trying to say. And I think that's what he was trying to say. And I think every entrepreneur embodies that in one form or another. I mean, you know, Michelle Romano on Dragons Den with me was told. It couldn't work. Uh, what do you mean? A, an online bank that would support online businesses. Doesn't make sense. I don't know what you're talking about. It's banks are brick and mortar. You know, you got charter A banks, charter B banks. Don't make it more confusing. Today, she's got a $2 billion, you know, unicorn, Canadian unicorn because of it, right? So uh, it's, 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 that's what entrepreneurship is. It isn't about, you know, because Michelle, if anything, can prove to you, you know, or, or I can, What's the connection between the movie theater business, being a general contractor, real estate, you know, uh, 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 restaurants, and now retail food? I mean, there's connections there. But the talents that I use and that I develop in the movie theater business, I can use in the branding of products. But it's two different factors. I got to adapt. And would I be any happier? in Mexico on a couch 24 hours a day, you know, 365 days a year saying, oh, I'm just looking at my stocks and looking how I'm doing. I mean, some people like doing that great for them, but that's not the true entrepreneurial spirit. The true entrepreneurial spirit is in many senses, you're gambling down, you're doubling down on stuff. You're betting on yourself first and foremost and on a situation, an evolving situation, right? Everybody knows I have nothing against online businesses, but I believe I'm a big brick and mortar guy. Why? Because I always like to say, you know, online is convenient, but it's not sexy. Why? Because most people who are shopping online are in their pajamas and they maybe haven't showered in two days or whatever, because they don't have to. They're alone in their place. So the minute you're going out for an experience, right? And, and the best example I can give you is, I had a talk show host once tell me, isn't the movie business bound to disappear? Because, you know, now with Netflix and all of those, you know, home streaming services and, and, and larger TV screens and so forth and so forth. Now let him talk. And then I said to him, tell me something. 
you have a kitchen at home, right? He says, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. A full kitchen, right? Where you can cook and everything, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You stop going to restaurants because of that? Uh, uh, no, not really. Okay, so why would you, because you have a bigger TV, you're going to stop going out and watching movies on the big screen? Or because you have a wife, you're going to stop going to a bar and have a drink? Like, I don't get it. Like, I, does it doesn't make sense, right? And it's because we forget humanity. Right? And, and COVID has proven something, that shutting down the world for three months is called a vacation. Shutting down the world for 12 months is a jail sentence. So now that everybody's been in jail for 12 months, everybody wants to go back to normality. Everybody wants to go back to Vegas. Everybody wants to go back to the movies. Every, you know, and, so, and so things will get back to normal. And I think for a few years, we will have some pent up demand on the entertainment side. And I think people will appreciate, right? So remember when our grandparents used to say, ah, you know, during the war, the suffering I went through, and, and we'd say, yeah, yeah, okay, get over it there. There hasn't been a war that's affected us in, in like 100 years, it was a lot. Like, we don't talk to you. Truth of the matter is COVID has been our war. It has been that, that situation that has created restrictions. I mean, there's no bombs that went off in our neighborhoods, but they went off in our brains, in our minds. I mean, the trauma of, of locking us down, of curfews, and, and, and you know, and then and then and then the, the 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 people pushing back, the you know, call them the conspiracy theorist guys, and the fear of what if those guys get into control? You know, look, I'll tell you, I was in I was in uh, Long Island, I was in East Hampton when the first shutdown occurred in you know early COVID, March uh, 14, 15. My wife panicked. My wife got worried. My wife, you know, for a minute, lost sense of, of I guess, not normality, but sense of, of, of balanced, argumentative, and said, oh, my God, we better get back to Canada. What if they don't let us out of the U.S. anymore? She said, what are you talking about? Well, what if it becomes like hands made tail where they're going to control everything? Are you kidding me? I mean, this is insane. But, but, but you can understand on how the minute you close down borders, it makes people panic. You know, the, the, the whole mental health issue is severe. And I think, you know, we still haven't seen the end of COVID per se. I mean, the COVID as a virus, I think we're done. But I think the repercussions on mental health, on, on the, you know, even on entrepreneurs, I can guarantee you that there's going to, there's, there's a whole segment of the entrepreneurial world who no longer feels that they should have zero dollars in their bank account because every penny must have a return on its investment. I can guarantee you there's a few guys who are saying, you know what, keep 10% liquid at all times. You never know when we have, we need a burn rate again to cover the craziness that the governments may impose upon us because of a fear of a virus, right? So I think everybody's been affected. I think, you know, we bought shopping malls, you know, I, I, you know out of the weirdest things. We bought shopping malls in the middle of COVID and everybody's saying like, are you crazy? The whole world will be online. Yeah, check this one out. And you'll see values of real estate will skyrocket once this temporary interest rate, you know, hike will, will, will have passed because people will go back to real estate. I think people want to get the hell out of their houses. Yeah, they see. I think people, you know, <laughs> it's crazy. Um, I want to I wanna finish up with a question that I ask everyone and, and it's always often reported as the most valuable, valuable part with this. So in... In, in, in a minute, in 30 to 60 seconds, I want you to tell me what was the most important thing that you ever learned? That nobody's coming to save me. Uh, that life is not what my parents told me it would be, but what I make, it, make of it. Um, that rules are only barriers to entry and that there is no rules, uh, um, you know, and that at the end of the day, the only true, and, and unfortunately, the only true person that you can only unequivocally count on at all times is yourself. And that unfortunately, this is the last thing that with success comes a lot of loneliness because if you look at success as a pyramid, you realize that as you go up the pyramid, there's less and less people at every level that understand what you go through. It's not that, that you don't want to share with them, but 
they don't understand what you're going through, right? And so it's a lonely journey that you've got to take on your own. Uh, but ultimately, if I could start all over again, would I do it again? Yep, 110%. I enjoyed every minute and every, every painful moment of anxiety that I had, I guess, made me who I am today. I, uh, I, I resonate with that a lot. And, and the loneliness thing, uh, it's, it's something that's interesting because, you know, when, when you have money, you can't have problems, right? Yeah. And so there's this, what could you be going through because you have money, but that comes from the inexperienced mind of someone who's never had it or been there. Because when you have, and you have that conversation, that level, like we are, you, you know, you get it at a, at a different level. So I, I definitely understand that, but um, I, I appreciate you. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, this is insanely valuable. And uh, um, where can our audience connect with you online? Follow what you're doing. So, sorry. Where, where can our audience follow you and, and find out what you're doing? You can follow me on Instagram at Lord Gutso. You can follow me on Twitter, Facebook. Uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm even on TikTok, but I haven't done a TikTok yet. I'm still trying to figure out what I should be doing on TikTok. I've seen some of my politicians go on TikTok and then got ripped to pieces. So I don't even want to go on TikTok right now. Yeah. So I'm you know, hoping to, uh, but on all social media platforms. Uh, and my wife always likes me to say, but not on Tinder, because I'm not on Tinder. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll go on TikTok and I'll look for your next uh, next dance cameo. Uh, okay, but, thank um, you. I appreciate you, my friend. <laughs> Bye-bye, guys. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Everything shared will be in the description of the episode, so you can go and grab that. Now, if you enjoyed the show and you want to listen to more, please subscribe because every week we're releasing new episodes with inspiring people, successful people, so you can level up your game. So subscribe and also leave us a review. We'd love to hear feedback about the show and your thoughts and opinions there as well. Now, if you want to have more success, whether it's in your life, whether it's in your business, we run live trainings every single week where you can get access to me to coach you through everything from health, wealth, success, business, we're doing topics on all things that you need to live a better, more inspired and successful life. Live training every single week. Just visit jamesnielsenwatt.com forward slash live and you can get access to that now. There's also a ton of resources that you get for just listening to the show. All of that will be in the description. So if you are watching this on YouTube, check the description. If you're listening to this episode, check the description. We've got a load of resources there for you to have more success in your life, whether it's relationships, investing, or in business. I'll see you on the next episode. And as always, subscribe, leave a review, and tell your friends because there's somebody else that needs to be hearing this, and maybe you're their opportunity to help them level up their game.